Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, how many uh, Python users do we have in the audience? Everybody here a Python user? Or there's some? Okay, who has never used Python? Is just trying to look in to see if we're all fools. Nobody's going to raise their hand to that question. Okay, so great. Uh, so if you're Python users, then you are well aware of some of the uh, analytics stories that have been in Python land for a long time. And uh, we've been coming to Strata for about four years. And the, one of our goals as a company, Continuum, has been to help scale out and scale up Python. And I'm really here today to talk about how uh, we're succeeding in that, in that story. As a little start, I'm not sure if this is going to entirely work, but at least it gives you a little bit of a kind of a look-see. This, this is a demo that's actually running on a machine back in Austin, tunneled through a VPN network. So hopefully it works uh, live. This is using a Bokeh application. And I can zoom in. This is what you're seeing here is actually 3 billion or nearly 3 billion points from the OpenStreetMap data rendered live using some of the parallel tools we're, talk we're going to talk about today. As you can see, the update is within three seconds. Uh, I'm interactively zooming in to all these data. It's, there's several things showing here. I mean, the data shader, come by our booth to learn more. I won't go into a lot of detail here. It's just really to uh, promote some of the, the reasons why I've been interested in paral parallelization and scalability. This is seeing all the data. So look what's happening. You can see all the data. This is the OpenStreetMap data. You just plot it up and look at it. You notice some kind of funny stuff going around the, the, the equator? That, that wouldn't show up if you sort of did pre-filtering first. It just shows up when you do kind of a histogram equalization to make sure you perceptually accurately see all the data. And you're processing it in real time. So when you zoom in, you can look at it. I'm not sure. It looks like there's some satellites that are reporting their GPS position <laughs> to the OpenStreetMap data. That's what it looks like to me. Not sure about that, but you can kind of see a little bit of the sinusoids uh, in the data itself. So this is the kind of thing you can you can start to do, and then you can zoom in on a particular area, and then see it, it, it'll alter the color map and alter the, the points in a few seconds. Um, there's no tiles, no pre-tiling, no tile rendering. It's just taking the viewport, updating it, changing the, the, uh, um, the perceptual map, so you can see all the data real time, 3 billion points. And it's using the tools we're going to show. So that's kind of a little bit of a uh, kicker, come by the booth. We can teach you more about how that works and how it can be used to visualize all kinds of data uh, for your purposes. All using Python, scalable Python, using Dask and Numba. So I want to talk today about basically a little bit of a tour through data, data science. It's going to be pretty quick. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to try to help understand uh, scale and how we scale out. So here's a short tour through data science and kind of how we, how we get here. Um, many people use Python because of its expressivity. It's easy to express kind of something like a word count. Very nice. You can explore. There's some you know, fairly uh, Pythonic approaches here that make it look nice. And then I can run. The challenge is it works only kind of in memory. And so it's scalable to, uh, it's not particularly scalable. Uh, it takes about three seconds for 45 megabytes CSV. Uh, but for a billion rows, it doesn't fit all in memory. What do you do? This lack of easy and obvious solutions to larger data sets is why some people believe that Python doesn't scale, because the nice and easy solutions don't actually work at scale. So Hadoop enters, and you split it up. There's various execution frameworks, but the MapReduce framework, and you can certainly apply Python as the map, and Python as Reduce, and people have done that. Um, but it's, it gets a little bit more, a little less Pythonic, a little more, um, I don't know, imperative, less exciting, less interesting, kind of more code. It's harder to read, harder to understand. Enter Spark. Spark uh, can be an improvement. Although it looks like when we're using Spark, we're basically just mapping kind of uh, low-level APIs, kind of the Spark APIs, with a gluing it together with Python syntax, which is nice. You can use some of the, the splits, the reduced by kind of concepts, but you end up, it's not quite as simple to use either. These are, different, these are the different APIs being used by the Spark, by PySpark. So um, one of the kind of an inconvenient truth about Python scalability is that the, typically the Python libraries in the Hoop ecosystem have kind of been the lipstick on the elephant in the room. Uh, sort of, they're, they can stream through kind of above, but they're not native. They're second class citizens in the past. The cognitive model is very different from typical Python development. Access to libraries is extremely limited. It's very common for people to go, oh, I love Python. It's got these great libraries. I can do machine learning quickly. I can iteratively connect with my data and have an immediate connection with what I'm doing, exploration. Then I have to do something else when I want to scale it out. And maybe use Spark, maybe a little arrays than Spark. How do pandas work there? Oh, they've got this new thing called data frames. It just doesn't, doesn't necessarily match. So core Hadoop is traditionally concerned with scalable, robust query performance. 
And even though Spark and Hadoop enable scale out for many data scientists, uh, the usability for ad hoc exploration is dramatically lower. And so most data scientists still stick with Python and R for their exploration and interaction. And, they, and they, the usability of the scale out effectively interferes with the ability to kind of have a smooth connection between what I'm trying to do as a data scientist and what I want to produce at scale in production. And this is, a, this is a basically a problem. So I wanna, for, for many of you, you probably understand this, this is very clear, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page in the room about what, what it means to scale and what the problems are. So I, we have scale up and scale out. You'll often hear those two terms. Scale up is about getting bigger boxes, making the nodes you have better, more memory, more disk space, uh, better CPUs. Scale out means just taking a box and making more of them and connecting them together. And then you have the best of both worlds, scale out a very can scaled up, but then you're um, you're, you're beating the uh, supercomputers of the world. So scaling up is about you know, typical programming. You have a CPU, a memory, and disk. We'll take that as our computer. And then you have an operating system on top, and then native code that talks to that. And when you scale up, you basically expand the CPU, expand the memory, expand the disk. But the operating system is still how you talk to it. And so the same code you used to write still works, and you kind of don't have to think about it very much. It just kind of works. And that's nice because that means all the tools you're used to using Python and R and native code just work. They, maybe there's some nuances as you get to terabytes of memory. There are some issues there, but uh, presumably it just works. Now, scaling out's a little bit different. Scaling out, you take the same disk, the same kind of CPU memory disk, and just make more of them, each with an operating system. Well, that's not good. What do I talk to? I have to put a worker on each one. And then there's a distrib distributed computing API. And that's what I end up talking to, is that distributed computing API. It's that switch that makes the programming model challenging. So we kind of call that the virtual distributed computer, the Hadoop cluster, for example. But now I have to program it with this distributed computing API. That's how I enter, I enter it. And, that, and doing that is what makes it challenging, because it's quite a bit different. If we look at these in parallel, kind of the ideal scale up, where I'm talking to the operating system, to all the nodes, to the scaled up nodes, or I'm talking to this distributed computing API. It's quite different. Uh, so, Ideally, I'd like to do this. I'd like to take my native code, my, C, my Python, my R, my, and just talk to that distributed computing API and have it just work. Right? You don't all want to care. <laughs> you just want to get your job done. You don't want to worry about all this other stuff that you now have to think about. You know, uh, latency, you have to worry about um, kind of, gosh, are my nodes running or not? You'd like kind of the OS to, to do that. And Hadoop has offered this promise of being the distributed OS. It'll handle all that for us. But the API it provides is not the same as the operating system API. So it isn't quite there. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's heroic efforts being done, and there's, there's um, many people that are, are working on this. So the programming model is really the key. How does the programming model work? It's not the same. And so that not the sameness is what causes all the, the challenges associated with bringing Python to the scale-out solution. So here's, here's a really cheesy uh, diagram of Hadoop, <laughs> the, most, the cheesiest one you'll see here. But basically, if you think of HDFS and YARN, HDFS is kind of managing the disk. There's the Java VM, kind of from both of these cases. And Yarn is kind of giving you access to CPU and memory on each of the nodes. And then that you, you, MapReduce was how you talked to that. That was the distributed API that was used. It was fairly limiting. I'll give you the example I saw before with the word count as a MapReduce example. Um, and SQL users would then use tools like Impala and Hive that would go on top of that stack and then give you a uh, more familiar interface. Spark out of this little section, basically, one, way to, one cheesy way to look at it is it, it took the memory and exposed it. So now the memory of all those compute nodes is just com exposed through the distributed API called the, the, using these uh, resilient uh, distributed data sets, the RDDs. And now I have a little more control, um, uh, but I, so Spark now becomes the API I call through, and it gives me a bit more access to the low-level memory. Java and Scala interfaces are direct, but when I'm talking about Python or R, now I have to go through additional layer, PySpark, Spark R, Talking about SQL, there's Spark SQL, and now I'm, um, which is good, but it's not 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 nearly as um, capable as the the typical interfaces that Python and R are used to using. So what's hard about distributed computing is really the fact that you, you are exposed to all those details effectively. The node goes down, and the longer your job is running, the more exposed you are. That's why it's temporal in nature. So if a job goes down, so it's if you can just do things quickly and you're out in and out in 15 seconds or less than a minute, then eh, not so bad. Uh, but if you're exposed to for hours, then you have to start worrying about that. So it's always still true, the fewer nodes you have, the less complex uh, distributed computing is. So optimizing performance on a single node, it turns out to, be, to matter. So that's why we talk about scale up and scale out. I don't think you can separate those two, because to really effectively scale out, you've got to make sure you're getting the performance out of each node first. 
that can make a huge number. We, we see lots of examples of, hey, I scaled out and it took 20 seconds. If I just scaled down, used a single node, actually took three. Uh, that happens all the time and continues to happen. So it's important to first, uh, performance is, a, is an aspect of correctness. What that means is to be correct, you have to be performant or else you're exposed to this problem of scale out. So, um, so kind of going back to why do we care about getting Python into the story in a real way, Python's nice because it's got a ton of core data structures, nice functions, nice spelling, huge library, uh, facilitates a wide variety of algorithms that all interop with each other, uh, open access to all these libraries. It's very easy to get high performance on a single machine when you need it. There's lots and there's, there's just a tremendous amount of work done uh, from compilers with Numba to Cython to interaction with Fortran code, very easy to link whatever high performance library you want. Scaling Python has been a challenge. Um, really automatically scaling it, kind of no magic, is really hard or impossible. There are some companies that are you know, taking distributed computers and bringing them together and putting an OS on top of it, making it look like just a scaled up machine. That's interesting work and there's a few out there that you can look at. Um, it's, they end up being fairly hard. Um, so what if? What if we sort of created, kind of like Spark did with the RDD across the memory, what if we created a little more scaling primitives to give you access to disk, memory, CPU, so that not, uh, basically not to support every possible programming model, but give the Python user the ability to write scalable solutions. At least the spelling could then be made congruent. So if we revisit kind of a little of the details, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through these slides that talk about some of the details of how um, the distributed API works with the JVM and with the details. So if we think of Hadoop as HDFS and Yarn and then a, uh, and an execution manager, the execution manager might be MapReduce or in Spark, it's the Spark uh, DAGs. Each of them have, an AVM, have a VM around them and these, the API you're talking with is either HDFS for storage Spark RDDs for memory and the Yarn cluster for the compute manager. And there's other ways to talk to the cluster manager as well, Mesos and, and other approaches people take. So um, typical PySpark approach ends up having to talk through that distributed API and it's, 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 it has a kind of multiple layers of indirection. So that has all kinds of challenges. You've got data flows, if you're, and, and, it's, and it's fine if your data flow is uh, not very large. When you start talking about gigabytes of data and you have to basically copy those gigabytes of data across multiple nodes, multiple times often, depending on the algorithm involved. Uh, and even if it stays in memory, you're going back from the, it's the, the memories in the JVM, it comes back to the Python native memory where it can be uh, executed on. And you're going through all these different layers in order to get a job done. It's not ideal. It's certainly not what the uh, Python users have come to expect from high performance Python. Uh, so you know, this is ideally what you'd like to be able to do is talk, have native code talk directly to disk, talk directly to memory, and get the job done. So what we've done is actually uh, a couple of things. We're super excited to talk about how we've just spent a lot of time helping to make Python connect more deeply to the Hadoop ecosystem. One way we've done that is actually by uh, leveraging a, a library called LibHFS3 that Pivotal uh, spent a lot of time writing, which is a great library for interactively, for native code interacting with data in HGFS. So without a JVM, without having to spin up Java at all, if your data's in HGFS, use the, the JVM is running to, to manage the data in HGFS as a service, that's just fine. But then if you wanna access the data in HGFS, you can do that from a native program. So HGFS Pi is this interface to that library that lets you directly talk. Native code can now directly talk to data inside of HGFS. Pull it in, start working with it. We think of, in that, so when we're building a execution framework for Python to work natively in Hadoop, then Hadoop for us is HGFS and Yarn. It's just those two pieces of it. We don't need an execution context because we can use the whole entire Python ecosystem for that execution. So, um, so you know, then that's kind of one start and you can kind of then say, okay, great, you can use IPython Parallel, use Joblib, use you know, kind of whatever MPI for Pi and, and now you've got access to um, Yarn. Uh, there's another library called Knit that we wrote. You can access Yarn, you can access the data. Now you can write whatever you want. Well, that's great, but it's still not as simple as certain kinds of problems. We still need a distributed Pythonic, um, uh, basically a Pythonic distributed computing uh, system. So enter Dask. Uh, how many have heard of Dask? Raise your hand if you've heard of Dask. So excellent, so a few of you have. Dask is actually about a year and a half old. It started as a project, we've always had a vision of this project being a distributed scheduler for uh, Python parallelism. 
having a distributed scheduler. A lot of the focus early on was spent on out of core, just making multiple, multiple, multiple processes work or multiple threads work so you could s distribute and parallelize your array calculations. So what it is, a parallel computing framework, it leverages the excellent Python ecosystem, uses blocked algorithms and task scheduling. I mean, that's what parallelism ultimately becomes, is I block up my problem and split it up. Uh, written in pure Python, so it's very easy to install, very easy to get. The core ideas are dynamic task scheduling yields same parallelism. It's a simple library to enable parallelism. And then importantly, provide a Dask array and a Dask data frame to provide the familiar APIs from NumPy and Pandas to the data scientists so they don't feel like they're switching gears. They basically write similar code to what they're used to, except now it works at scale, leveraging the underlying libraries, just broken them up into chunks and then leveraging the underlying libraries. So we don't have to rewrite those libraries, we can just use them but now we use them chunked in parallel. That's the, that's, the key path, that's the key idea. So therefore, we can go pretty quickly. You know, we just basically write that connective tissue, write that distribution concept, and then reuse all the code that's out there in the great Python ecosystem. So if you look at the Dask, it's a very simple architecture. You have the whole Python ecosystem you can use. There's basically a Dask graph specification, uh, then Dask schedulers that run that specification, and then collections on top that help you build graphs so you don't have to do it manually. You can just write array code, you can write data frame code, and you get sane solutions. But the nice thing about the library is it's, very, it's quite orthogonal. So the task graph is you have much more access to it. If you're familiar with Spark, Spark has a graph as well, although that DAG is typically you can't modify too much of it. You kind of only talk to the APIs. Task graph is a little bit different. It's a little more coarse grained. So you have access to, sorry, more fine grained, excuse me. You have access to the tasks that you want to run. The other piece is schedulers are orthogonal. You can write your own scheduler. DAS comes with three basic schedulers, a multi-threaded, multi-processing, and then a distributed scheduler that can work on many, many, and many nodes. So, and others, if you'd like, could write their own. The interface is very simple. And then there's these collections. These collections are where most data scientists will enter the DASC arena. They won't necessarily write the, the DAGs or the directed graphs themselves. They'll write array expressions data frame expressions. The DAS bag is similar to an RDD. It's like a list, distributed list. Uh, you can certainly use it for lots of things. So here's an example. So DASC array, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to give you kind of a high level perspective. Uh, DASC arrays allow for NumPy-like expressions. So how many NumPy users in the audience? Hopefully a bunch of you if you're Python users. OK, only a few. OK, it's too bad. Try it out. <laughs> okay, how many Pandas users, actually? OK, you all are NumPy users as well. So. <laughs> Uh, but I understand if you're using pandas as the front end, that's great, no problem at all. Um, it's, a great it's a great library. But uh, particularly for multidimensional arrays that don't necessarily have columns or headers, you still want to be able to deal with, uh, so you got slicing syntax, you got fancy indexing, some linear algebra is actually supported already. And there's parallel algorithms like top k, approximate quantiles. You can do ghosting arrays. All of these basically are the API that's similar to NumPy. Now, it's not the entire NumPy API. It's, it tries to get as close as you can, but there will absolutely be some APIs in NumPy that can't scale. Effectively, they're not parallelizable, so they're, they're not going to show up, which provides an interesting approach, basically. If you find yourself with an algorithm in NumPy, and you go, hey, I want to write this in Dask, it should be just simple. Basically, you know, import Dask as and Dask.array as NP in many cases. Uh, you might have to add some chunk sizes in certain areas. Uh, if you find that a method isn't there, maybe your algorithm doesn't scale, actually. And that's an important thing to know um, so that you don't uh, necessarily inadvertently, uh, you want to future-proof your algorithm for scaling. So actually, by using Dask arrays, you're kind of knowing that I can scale this uh, if I'm using this approach, using similar interfaces that I'm used to. So it's out of core parallel NumPy arrays. Uh, the data frame is not OOC parallel any array. It's uh, out of core parallel data frames. So it uses pandas under the covers. Like I said, we're not. Um, rewriting pandas, we're using pandas, but just in a chunked approach, and we write this API on top so that Dask, when you do these expressions like row-wise selections, element-wise operations, aggregations, group buys, value counts, merging, when you do that, what it does is insert extractions in the graph so that that'll be accomplished on the various nodes and the various uh, cores when it, needs time, when it comes time to compute time. And it leverages the tools that are there to do that. So in the end, when you write these expressions or these method calls that look like pandas expressions, that look like NumPy arrays, you end up with a DAG of computation, a directed acyclic graph of computation. This is a very simple one, actually. They can get quite complicated. It's the job of the scheduler, then execute this graph. So here's an example using uh, X-Ray. X-Ray is a, a nice interface on top of 
uh, NumPy as well. It basically use, it's like generalizes pandas to multidimensional arrays. Kind of puts labels on all the axes, gives you a chance to deal with multidimensional arrays. It uses Dask in order to do its parallelism. So it's a very nice, it, it's starting to show how Dask is being adopted by the rest of the community as a way to do automatic parallelism. And as there's other examples in scikit-image, pandas, scikit-learn. So here's another example of scientific big data. The, the, the graphs get a little bit more expressive. One nice thing about Dask is you can actually, if you're sophisticated, or you're, you're the one sophisticated person in your group of 10 uh, data scientists on your team, uh, you can get in and kind of actually see the graph and maybe modify it. Maybe we don't have an API that does exactly what you want. The graph is a dictionary of keys, ultimately. So you can go in and basically change, alter it. Here's an example for cross-validation that's just constructed effectively manually. You build the graph that needs to be executed. So again, you just clean Python syntax, so it's fairly straightforward. Even if you're not the expert, you can at least understand it when you see it, what's happening, and get a feel for what's going on. Here's an example of LUD composition, the graph that results when you do a LUD composition on a Dask array. And there's, there's two lines, linalg, LU, DA. What that does is ultimately provide an algorithm that does it in chunks, uh, so then you can see the result. And then this is just comparing it. And the visualize is a method, is a nice little method on the Dask um, arrays and Dask uh, data frames that give you these nice little plots. Um, be careful, they can get really big and really ugly <laughs> depending on how large your problem is. Um, so I've heard some people talk about putting, here, here's my workflow, let's put this Dask graph across the room as a big nice uh, diagram of, so when people come in and say, what are you guys working on? You can show them, this is what we're doing. <laughs> See how hard it is? <laughs> And it does kind of certainly vis make visible all, that, all those tools. So with Dask and Hadoop, so Dask runs independently of Hadoop. It's not dependent on Hadoop. It can run on top of any cluster situation, including Hadoop. With Hadoop specifically, what we've done is added some APIs to HDFS so that Dask, the distributed scheduler, can load, HDFS, like load data from HDFS on multiple nodes, and the scheduler knows about it. So the data, it can do data, data local data locality aware scheduling. And the piece of the graph that needs to be executed will only go to where the data is sitting. So that's kind of the important piece that's added. HDFS as a library can be used by a single node to read data from all of HDFS data. And you could do that if you wanted, pull it all in through that single, head, that single node you're running on. But with the HDFS and distributed, now you load it in parallel. And you get true parallel computing on read. And now your workflow is then data local. So it's a, it's a very nice kind of uh, interaction. And then with a library called Knit, we can talk to Yarn and start up Dask workers and all the nodes, kind of have Yarn do it for us. So now your, da your Hadoop cluster is basically ready and, ready, ready and available to go with Dask. And with a little more capability, it was a little more, if you're a, a sophisticated developer or, or Python user, you basically have access to everything. I'd love to see examples of people using this to maybe for, take their Hadoop cluster and five machines run an MPI for PyJob <laughs> that's doing some, uh, maybe Elemental, or maybe there's lots of libraries that have been linked to Python that use several nodes of, of machines. And it's all available now. So it really is bringing together, and we've seen this happening for a while, but this is a tool that really brings together the HPC work that's been going on for years, that's kind of colliding with the big data analytics work, and the only limit is your imagination, your capability, and your um, creativity. So here's an example of kind of what this looks like in practice. So the distributed comes from Dask. Uh, distributed is actually an independent library. One of the things um, the Matt Rocklin, the, the principal developer of, the, of Dask, does is he likes separation. So distributed, the scheduler is actually a separate install and it's independent of the Dask concept and you can use it independently. You build up an executor on a head node. This is where the HDFS reads CSV. It's just reading from an HDFS uh, CSV file in HDFS and doing it in parallel. Uh, it's actually not doing anything. What it's doing is setting up a graph of reads on all those nodes. <laughs> the HDFS you know, queries the system, finds out where the chunks are, and goes and puts in the executor a, look, um, a task to read the part of it that it wants to. And here's New York City 2014, 2015, and then I can basically, the persist command, what it does is loads to memory. It persists in the memory and actually does something, executes on those graphs. So that, that uh, 50 gigabytes on disk, not a lot of data, but it, it creates 400 sharded pandas data frames, 128 megabytes on each node, or each um, core. And then what, what that enables is you have a very familiar programming model. New York City, these are now data frames, Dask data frames, but the data frames are similar to pandas in which you can do kind of uh, uh, find out how many rides didn't tip. So NYC, there's a tip amount field. I can find where they're equal to zero, that creates kind of a mass selection. I select out those uh, elements in the data frame and then look at the payment type and then the number of counts. 
Now the last, the only difference is that the last point is this compute that uh, produces, that's what actually does the computation. Because everything else in Dask is just building up a graph of things to do later. And then the compute actually uh, runs, the, runs the job. And then you can see it ran and you look at, there's a whole lot of um, rides that didn't tip supposedly. I wonder if the payment amount, we think the payment amount too is cash and people just aren't reporting tips. So you can kind of see that very quickly on the data set and using your familiar API, but now it's running across a cluster and you can run it on, in, at scale. Uh, here's another example of you know, finding out the tip by day of week, by hour of day, fair amount greater than zero, payment type not equal to two, let's look at that and compare um, when tips happened. Uh, so if you're familiar with pandas, these will look very familiar. You can write this kind of expressions, but now remember it's working across your distributed cluster. And uh, there's, there's actually some nice little tools in distributed, in, in Dask and distributed, uh, that especially in the notebook or the Jupyter notebook, you can see little progress bars, you can see things running, it gives you kind of an interactive help to know what's happening. And uh, apparently people are very generous around 4 a.m. in New York City. So if you're a taxi driver in New York City, might be a good chance to you know, get up at two, drive around, you might make better tips. Uh, another example, again, the purpose is just to show you how it looks the kind of code you write and how um, it looks very, very Pythonic, very similar. Uh, HDFS read text, I'm reading JSON files from text on each worker now. I'm gonna load the JSON data, look for comments in, uh, in the r slash r slash movies, should have, see if that shows up in the string. So using the filter um, command, I give this lambda function, and then that creates again a, a graph of tasks to perform. The persist method actually executes those tasks on each of the nodes to give me in memory the data so that later when I go back and do more, it's not going from scratch, it's going from those that intermediate point, kind of it's a memoization or a caching mechanism, kind of a, a de deterministic caching mechanism. And then looking for mentions of Kevin Spacey. Um, and then you, know, you can do easy text processing to NLTK. Basically the interface to the, dis the distributed scheduler lets you map any function across all the nodes. So whatever function you like, can be any kind of Python function, um, this is a typical uh, natural language processing approach. And I map it across all of the, uh, the movies. And then one nice thing about the interface is there's high level inter approaches where you don't even think about the fact that I have a distributed cluster. I don't even think about the fact that it's running in parallel. You can just do that at a high level, right? Data frame, right? array queries. Then there's some times where, well, I can't quite do what I want. I wanna do something slightly different on each node. Um, you know, parallel computing and the kind of analysis you want to do can get complicated. So having, so what, one, one very nice thing about this system is it's flexible. So you can, if you want, kind of just run the code you want across all the nodes, you can get access to that. You can get access to the graph that is trying to be uh, run. It's uh, uh, a little closer to, to Tez in that way from Hortonworks, I guess, which is a new, is a new, map, new framework that they're experimenting with as well. So takeaways, key takeaways. Uh, Pythonic spelling for parallel arrays and data frames. You know, super excited about that. It's been, in, it's been, you know, this has been a process. We've, we started working on this four years ago. 2012, we came to, to Strata. I started to become aware of the, you know, kind of the fact that lots of people were storing data in Hadoop. Lots of people were using Python, but couldn't do it in parallel. And a continuum, we really were, have been wanting to scale out Python for a long time. We've talked about that for at least four years. And we've got some help from DARPA and the XData program to work on it. Dask has emerged from that effort. And uh, it's, it's absolutely a part of that effort, and we're super excited that it's working today. And you can absolutely scale out Python. Now, it's not perfect, it's still a work in progress, and I'm sure you'll find issues, but we, we would love your participation. It's an open source project available on GitHub. Uh, there's a Dask project and available. And the big thing today we're talking about is that you have direct access to Hadoop now. Direct access to data in HGFS without paying any cost of JVM serialization or um, any other kind of overhead of using a, a Pi for J library to talk through a JVM and then to a Python native. You can go directly, use the whole Python ecosystem to talk directly to your data in HDFS. Buy this HDFS library and definitely kudos to Pivotal who put a lot of effort into the C++ tool that we're leveraging and bringing to Python. Uh, we're very excited about the Cloudera's Arrow project. I see in it, in the Arrow project, a uh, common thread that we've been working on to try to, as well with the data shape and with Dyn, tools that basically let you write data in a way that all languages can access as opposed to putting data in, kind of hiding it into the JVM, where then only Java can talk to it. And you kind of limit yourself, make it, well, you don't limit it, but it's very difficult then to get, to reuse C++, C libraries, Fortran libraries, which need pointers and need, need access to the data. 
You can only use it by copying, and that's fine if you've got 100 megabytes. When you've got a gigabyte or more, it starts to get really, really difficult and limiting. Um, so you can load data into distributed memory by a persist. So you can have kind of long-running processes with data all throughout memory, and you can do all kinds of interactive computing on it. And then we can directly schedule uh, compute resources using NIT from Python uh, via YARN. So those are the, the key, key facts. Definitely want to remind you, even though this is Strata Hadoop world, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about the Hadoop interfaces, Dask is, is not dependent on Hadoop. It's something that can be added and used with Hadoop, but it can be used outside of that as well. There's several, uh, works well with any distributed computing framework, Sun Grid Engine, IPython Parallel. Uh, there's a convenient Duck2 library. You can, there's some simple examples for, you know, in 10 seconds, get up and running with, like, maybe it's 10 minutes actually to allocate uh, 10 uh, EC2 instances, MX larges. But it's very easy for you to get started doing parallel computing. You don't have to have an IT administrator. You just have to have an uh, account and somebody to pay the hardware, I guess. Uh, it's not your own checkbook. Uh, very, it's excellent for embarrassing parallel problems. And the, and the diagram here is basically disk, memory, CPU, all accessible through native code, including Python via the Dask worker. There's a single scheduler that, actually, that takes a Dask graph that has been built up from either directly or Dask arrays, Dask data frames. So it's a, it's a complete system that allows both scale up and scale out, uh, scale up because you can leverage all the Python capability, including number compilation, uh, and it works great with existing C++ fast code, and it kind of all comes together. So it really is allowing productivity at all scales. Um, Scaling out is important for production and data processing. We know that, right? It's fine to scale up, but there are going to be cases, doesn't matter what you do, where you're going to want to solve a problem bigger than, ever, than the, the, the best machine you can buy, and you're going to want to scale them out, stick them together. Definitely true. So it is important, and uh, there also may be, there may be questions about availability of hardware, too. Sometimes you really can't go just buy new big machines. You have to use the machines that are there in a scale-out way. So all those constraints mean that scaling out is important. However, Scaling up or scaling down, which means subsample the data and actually explore it. Uh, subsampling the data is important for agility, fast iterations, when you're trying to just figure out what's going on. It's important not to get lost in the iteration and the difficulty of scale out when you just want to figure out what's going on. And that's, um, so you don't compromise agility for the sake of future proofing. However, with Dask, what ends up happening is you can have agility as well as future proofing because you can do scalable analysis on a single machine with multiple, with a, just a single multi-threaded workers, multi-processing workers, and then scale out to distributed. So that's where the real wins begin, is use the same language, the same API across scales. And uh, we, we believe that Python allows that. So I have a little bit of time, so I, uh, but it's great. It's, I think I have a few minutes left for questions, and so I'd love to, to take them. Yes, thank you. Perfect. The question was, how does this work with things like scikit-learn? Uh, it's a great question. So scikit-learn, of course, is using linear algebra operations, using SciPy primarily, and then additional things on NumPy. There are a few cases where you have these grid searches and parameter searches where you can easily plug in a, par a parallel solution. That's happening right now, actually. There's, they use joblib, but there's a back-end of joblib using distributed that's just a pull request right now on the scikit-learn. And then we, so that's in progress. And then I'm looking forward to additional scikit-learn style. I and mean, you can take kind of the scikit-learn algorithm and just translate it to a linear algebra. If you know the SciPy library, the iterative solvers, the biconjugate gradient, the Krylov subspace solvers that are in, Pi, that are in SciPy, they have a linear operator op option. All you have to do is have a matrix vector multiply. And that's easy to do with Dask. And then you can sort of have open, all of those iterative solvers are available that SciPy provides. And there'd be ways to do scikit-learn on top of that. So I'm looking forward to that, but it's still a work in progress. Yes. Question on the distribution, and I'm I'm wondering, are you basically for Dask pushing like eggs or wheels around with all its dependencies for each job, or do you pre-install those? How does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. It's orthogonal, so we don't make a decision about that. So we assume there's something installed for all the for the distribution. So you can run it. So you can run it where however you've got the distribution working. Now, a, a continuum, of course, we make it very easy to distribute Conda environments. Mm -hmm. uh, we have both commercial tools as well as free tools that make it very easy to push whole con environments he's around. Because mm -hmm. that's a very important problem. That's a separate talk and discussion. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's independent of that. OK, so and, the, and then for you Yarn, you would that. have to bundle it up as a jar. Probably. Yeah, so there are examples okay. of doing that, actually. A few people are experimenting with using Yarn to kind of bundle this, the libraries needed and then pushing those out through you know, letting Yarn do the distribution okay. effectively. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. You can talk about that in more detail if people want. Yeah.
So the question is, what will happen if the, ob if the algorithms on a single node using standard Python objects aren't parallelizable? Oh, yeah, so, it, so Dask, importantly, is not like a magic button that takes your, your, um, scale, your single node code and then works automatically. What it is is a parallel framework with primitives. You can then, uh, you do have to rewrite your code, but the, but the APIs are the same in, in, in most of the cases. So often it's just, again, a single uh, you know, search and replace. It can be, unless you've used methods that aren't parallelizable and then are, or, or aren't available yet on the Dask data frame or Dask array. So it's not a, yeah, it definitely is not a, here, take your NumPy code, we automatically parallelize and scale it. No, it's, it's, here's a way for you to write code that's future-proofed and parallelizable and scalable that uses the same APIs and, and methods. So thanks for the question. Does that, that help? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Have we used, have we tested the efficiency with I'm not hearing the compared with what? Multiple? Multiprocessing. Oh, with multiprocessing library. So da the scheduler, the multiprocessing scheduler of Dask uses multiprocessing. So it's sort of, that's what we use for the multiprocessing case. Uh, there's a little bit of overhead on top to handle the scheduler, but it'll, you'll get the same performance multiprocessing provides for the local case. Now we have done comparisons of Dask to say PySpark you know, using PySpark. And what we find is that if you're doing array kinds of calculations, data frames, building arrays, doing, doing things that leverage NumPy and Pandas, we can get 10 to 100 times faster than PySpark. Now, if you're just doing, because um, basically we're not leaving anything on the, on the table, we're not worrying about going back and forth from the JVM, so we get raw kind of the performance capability of the system. Now, if you're doing things like word counts and dictionaries and lists of dictionaries, and it's very, it's very Python, not array, co array code, then it's roughly the same as PySpark. Maybe a little faster, maybe a little slower in some cases. So, so thanks, yeah. Thank you very much. L love this stuff. I have a question about in the Hadoop environment, if I'm running with Yarn, and let's say I have a bare scheduler and queues, and I'm competing with Spark jobs and other crap in there, <laughs> how, d how does this play? Does it play well and play nice? And what happens when there's memory contention and I don't have enough RAM to persist? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the, there's, all these things are still being explored, right? I mean, we use Yarn to grab resources, so if Yarn allow, provides them, then we run a long-running process called dworker from, you know, given that resource. But you're absolutely right. If you've got multiple jobs running, you can have memory contention. Persist will error. I mean, you'll get an error if it happens. Then you can adjust. You can deal with it. Uh, one nice thing about the distributed scheduler is it actually is fairly fault, it's fault tolerant. So you can take out a node. The scheduler keeps running. You can add one in, schedule keeps running. So you can kind of, it's, it's real time, you can add new nodes and take them out. And things keep running until all the, basically all the tasks are completed and, and back to the, to the head node. Yeah. Yeah, good question. I'm interested in those, those answers too. I don't have all of them. So, um, and maybe I, I missed this uh, too. I'm extremely excited about this because I've been trying to figure out how to do exactly what you've been using is leveraging um, um, your guys' uh, Anaconda with, with Spark. Um, so you, you would just log into a regular Spark node, let's say on AWS, and then um, launch Dask, or you're still gonna, how, how's it gonna connect that as Python? Or do you still have to somehow go through PySpark? I guess I'm still not quite yeah, understanding. No, so, and how to use the Jupyter Notebook, which I still have never figured out how to do. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's, it's actually independent of Spark. So you don't need to use Spark. I do have an example where we're giving a talk at the GPU Technology Conference. The talk title was using GPUs with Spark. So we have an example where they ended up actually using Dask to do distributed parallelism, and it was much faster. But in order to satisfy the title, we do have a Spark interface to it on top. It's completely unnecessary. So I would say there are still some cases. What, you know, the story here is here's another approach to parallel execution that is independent of Spark. Now, Spark's still a great tool, and you can still use Spark with Anaconda, and you can still use Spark with Jupyter, and there's many cases where you may want to use that as well. So the way I would think of Dask is it's a separate parallel execution framework that lets you basically run things in parallel, read data from HDFS directly. So you, just, so you have to get a, no, a cluster, you have either a Hadoop cluster or it's Amazon nodes. You just got to basically run dworker on how many nodes you want. Then you run a program called dscheduler on one of them as well. And there's tools that we've, that we've got to make that easy. Deck 2 is a tool that makes it easy to do it on EC2. So it spins up the nodes, it puts dworker on all the nodes, puts dscheduler on one of them. And then when you 
open up a Jupyter network, a Jupyter notebook, you basically, there's a piece of code you run called executor. And there's an example in the slides. And there's also a great blog post on this as well. Uh, if you go to Matt Rockland's blog, we'll be promoting these blogs more and more. It can show you exactly how to talk to the executor and then run nodes from there. So um, I can, we can come by our booth, we can talk about that in quite a bit of depth if, 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 if that helps. Yeah, thanks, thank you for clarifying. I agree, it's, it's exciting, but it's new. And so it's important to understand the nuances. Yeah, so you, you talk about several types of schedulers, like uh, based on multiprocessing or threaded, uh, or well, the distributed scheduler. Uh, but can, can, you, can you combine them easily with Dask? For example, if I have a, an EO bound problem and I want to use multiple nodes, but on each node I want to run like uh, a lot of threads, uh, can I combine like uh, uh, schedulers? Like so with Dask, you just have one scheduler you use, but you, uh -huh. can but you can certainly call functions in your Dask graph that might use threads okay. on each node. We do that all the time with Numba. Okay. Use GPUs on every node, but you use one, one scheduler for your graph presently. Okay, thank you. Then, so the other part of parallelism would you handle underneath that with, okay. the, with the function calls in Python. Okay. Great question. Thanks. Thanks. I think we're out of time. I'm ha we're at booth 1336. I can be available outside. I'll have office hours later today uh, as well, so happy to answer questions.